Hey guys, this is Cameron Bowen, Tim from Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Hello, team. Welcome to Whelmed Reprints. It's holiday season here in the States, so we'll be taking some time to spend with our families and to get ready for Season 3, premiering on January 4th, 2019. If you're in the States, Happy Thanksgiving. With Whelmed Reprints, our team will be picking a few of our favorite episodes to bring to new listeners. And our first reprint harkens back to another first, our first two-part discussion session. Quinn Wilson host and creator of the Swallows the South Actual Play podcast, took our discussions to a new level. Quinn and I happen to live in the same city, so when having lunch one day, he started in on what would become this discussion. Quinn and I dive into the use of linguistics and psychology as a tool to develop character in your stories. We talk about Dick Grayson and Zatanna's linguistic skills and their implications, the expression of the concepts of identity versus personality in characters like Miss Martian, code switching between teenagers and adults and figures of authority, as well as between cultures and languages like with Blue Beetle and Impulse, and so much more. If you're a fan of Young Justice and have only gotten a chance to listen to our review episodes, we can't recommend Quinn's guest appearance enough. He helped set the bar for the depth and breadth of creative conversation we have here on Whelmed. Thank you, Quinn. From all of us here at Whelmed, have a great holiday season and stay whelmed. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, zero, one. Recognized, Monkey Pie Quinn, D, zero, seven. Today in the cave, we have Monkey Pie Quinn, a.k.a. Quinn Wilson. Quinn is the storyteller of the actual play podcast, Swallows of the South, based on the Exalted RPG system. In addition to being a respected podcaster in the gaming industry and an improvisational actor in the San Diego theater scene, Quinn has studied both psychology and anthropology, as well as having a direct line into the world of linguistics. Quinn, welcome to the cave. Thank you so much for having me, Rich. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm so glad you came on the show, man. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series, the comics, and even potentially the video game. If you have not seen or read or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. So with all that, let's dive in. So Quinn, um, I'd give a little bit of an intro there, but uh, tell us a little bit more about what you do and where that link to linguistics comes from. Yeah, I am basically in my academic life, someone who is very, very interested in the intersection of psychology and anthropology. And over time, I've come to really, really appreciate and love different facets of the anthropological field. One of those being anthropological linguistics or sociolinguistics, depending on the field background of the person that you're talking to. And my older brother, who also watched the entirety of Young Justice, is a master's student in linguistics. And so we spend a lot of time talking about anthropological and linguistic theory. So in addition to the direct and formalized training that I've received through my schooling, I've also received a bit of a buffer and refresher course through various different aspects of sociolinguistics through my discussions with him. Nice. I had a question, though. When we're talking about linguistics, when you say linguistics, is your is your brother bi or multilingual, or is he talking about linguistics in a more general sense? And for that matter, you, are you bilingual? Do you speak more than one language? I have, living in San Diego, just a little bit of generalized Spanish know-how. Mm-hmm. And per the schooling that I've done, I'm technically an intermediate level speaker of Japanese, but I don't remember most or any of <laughs> the coursework that I took at this point. So I would say that right. I am firmly monolingual. Yeah. And so is my brother. He, again, has little smatterings of different stuff here and there. He's taken a little bit more Japanese than I have, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting. But uh, a lot of people hear linguistics and they think that it's people learning different languages right that's what i wanted to ask yeah and that's not necessarily or really generally speaking what it is if you want to become a polyglot the best way to <laughs> get there is to go and study 
different languages so that you can learn how to speak them, whereas linguistics is looking at, it's a broad field, but it's looking at the mechanics, components, and interrelationships and functions of language, as opposed to language as these are what words mean and this is how you put together sentences. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little more divorced from that sort of direct studying Spanish so that you can speak it versus studying Spanish looking at its... Like its history it's and how history, it's... history, yeah. grammatical structure, ways that different people in different Spanish-speaking countries use the language, and then even within those countries how different people of different backgrounds, social strata, gender, ethnicity, etc., then use that to sort of navigate their world, construct their identity, and convey meaning and ideas. Yeah, that makes sense. Just to get a little background as far as the show is concerned, when did you first watch the show? Did you see it when it first came out, or did you watch it on Netflix, DVD? What's so, your story? And what's your experience with comics? Was this the first time you've been exposed to DC, or what's your history with comics with that as well? Okay, I first was exposed to the idea of Young Justice about four years ago when I was taking a class with the person who would become my long-term partner, and she was watching it as it came out. Mm. And adored it. And I could not find a venue through which I had access to it. Right. But she talked about it a lot. So that kind of left an impression on me. And then about a year ago, following you on Twitter, watching the general buzz and hubbub about Young Justice, I <laughs> then found myself sort of embroiled in this, remembering <laughs> how much my partner was absolutely enamored with it. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down together and we watched all the way through it uh, on Netflix. Nice. And my general relationship to DC and comics before this is I've done piecemeal reading here and there over my life. I've never been someone who has like a weekly schedule where I go and I pick up comics every week, but I've done some dives in at different points. And I think that because of my more casual general approach to the comic scene and my relative youth i watched some of the justice league animated series when i was younger right uh picked up some dc stuff through there but aside from other like tie-in or expanded materials i didn't read a lot of dc because i grew up in the age where marvel was seen as kind of the de facto purveyor of quality comics materials where mm -hmm. dc has been kind of written off for various strange reasons yeah and so watching young justice and seeing the intense multiverse the very very intricate world building that had been done it made me realize that dc had and still has just a heck of a lot to offer that i had because of just the circles that i ran around in been trained to kind of push off to the side or yeah. dismiss out of hand yeah i don't think you're alone in that either i think there's we've talked to a lot of people that have watched the show that quoting one of our listeners i had no idea dc had this much to offer so you're definitely not alone in that boat yeah, I think that that was basically my exact reaction was didn't realize that there was this much, especially this much wonderful, like top tier content. Yeah. But playing off that, are there any specific storylines or characters that jumped out at you while you were watching the show for yourself? So watching it, I found myself very, very quickly enamored with Calderon. Mm -hmm. He, as a character, just really clicked and worked well for me very, very quickly. Yeah. And I actually really liked a lot of the stuff and the storylines that they played with McGann over time. Yeah. Delving more back into the social situation and the social cultural context that she grew up in and trying to navigate that in yeah. relationship to being on earth and she actually employs some of that in interesting ways linguistically over time in ways that are very very obvious and coded or marked in her language she falls back into this sort of valley girl speech because of her exposure to earth culture right her one obsession and sort of cultural touchstone has become this thing which she falls back on sometimes when she isn't sure how to socially navigate a situation. Right. Because it makes her easier to deal with or it breaks down things into these easily parsable stereotypes that people then are able to deal with. So she's almost intentionally obfuscating the complexity or nuance of her character in the interest yeah. of trying to make herself 
understandable in these situations that can be very, very difficult for her to navigate. Yeah, that's a fantastic, fantastic view on McGann as a character. And we're going to we're gonna dive into McGann and everybody else, too, from that perspective with this, which I'm super excited about. The last thing I want to ask as a storyteller and, and really a professional gamer, is there anything that you pull from the show that it may have been and may have inspired you at all have you been interested in doing a superhero rpg or have you wanted to reskin any storylines or character development points for fantasy or sci-fi games or stories well i will say that i played a wonderful game of masks a new generation oh with yeah Brandon Leon Gambetta of the Stop Hack and Roll podcast and some other people, Jeff Stormer and Megan Dornbrock, and going in, looking through the character archetypes, mm-hmm. I 100% touched into and played off of my love of both X-Men and then particularly Young Justice looking at this game really well scaffolds a lot of the narratives and the ongoing themes mm-hmm. of the show. Yeah, And so that was great. And, well, I haven't been tempted to necessarily pull specific arcs or storylines from the show. It has caused me to do a lot of reflection on overall narrative pacing, yeah, general beats and where to place them or where not to place them. Mm-hmm. And I think that if I hadn't consumed Young Justice, I might not have gotten as interested or dived in as much as I have in my own podcast and general gaming now that I do away from a microphone in piecing apart and talking to people about character elements, Mm -hmm. potential character arcs, and then underlying defining conflicts which push those characters so that we have a communal understanding of not necessarily where the character is going to end because there are emergent elements to Mm -hmm. gameplay that are not necessarily present in screenwriting. Mm Mm-hmm. But they do allow you a scaffold and a mutual understanding so that you can create more grounded, engaging, thematic content that allows to set the ground for some of that emergent yeah, storytelling absolutely. that does happen in gaming. Masks is uh, Magpie Games, produced Masks, uh, had a successful very successful kickstarter and it just is released to the public now right so by the time this releases you can absolutely go pick up masks and i highly recommend it um we'll be talking about it more on the show at various times we're also planning on doing an ap actual play podcast as well as a bonus uh, episode series for the show which should be a ton of fun as well awesome so you kind of mentioned this a little bit before you and i met after i kept hearing amazing and well-deserved things about swallows of the south which is your actual play podcast but it wasn't until much later that i found out you actually lived Live here in San Diego with me. A lot of the podcasters we know live in Chicago and New York and in Washington, D.C. And the last time you and I got together, we started talking about the use of language in Young Justice, specifically my love of the use of subtitles and real world languages for a show like this, which takes more time, more thought, more effort, more search for actors who are fluent in these languages, etc., etc. And then they've also taken the time to create Atlantean, Martian, Croatan, Ronian, a list of other D.C. comics languages, even to the, even to the point where they created a the name of a culture in the second season, the Polyglotcher of Rimbor, which I just remembered when you mentioned becoming a polyglot earlier. The Polyglotcher of Rimbor, meaning I'm assuming a massively metropolitan, multicultural, multilingual, you know, planet. Of course, those of you with the DC Universe knowledge will know that Rimbor is actually a planet that is commonly referred to in the 30th or 31st century Legion of Superheroes comics as the home of Ultra Boy. So it was interesting to see that they're using that as, you know, 10 centuries beforehand as as one of the chosen planets. I was curious to see if they're going to do anything with that. But then you started to unpack in the conversation a mind-blowing world of linguistics to me as we started chatting about all these various characters. So quickly, if you can, before we dive into Young Justice and kind of what these things mean, there were quite a bit of lingo you were using with me that uh, some I knew a little bit about because my wife's a a special education teacher, so some of these are familiar. But one of the things, uh, and these are things I'm assuming you're going to use later, can you let us know there's some things here code switching register personality is process index indexicality like can you dive in what, what's code switching basically okay so this is actually something that's interesting because depending on who you're t- 
talking to, you can get two different takes on what is and is not code switching. Some people refer to one type of this code switching as register switching instead, which means I should oh. probably simultaneously define yeah. what a register is. Sure. So a register is the idea that you speak differently to different people in different situations depending on context. Okay. You probably address your family in a way that is different from the way that you address your coworkers. You might be more right. forthright. You might be more in, in several ways. You could be more affectionate, but you could also be more direct in addressing certain ongoing issues, what have you, because you have the emotional intimacy and you don't have as much distance, especially you're going to speak differently with, for example, a romantic partner than you might a supervisor at work. Sure, that makes sense, right? So it is about navigating relative status with the person that you're talking to through language. And so register is important to understand that it is contextually bound. It depends on context. And a huge important part of that context is relative power and intimacy. Mm. Oh, interesting. So code, code switching then, what's the difference between register switching and code switching? So sometimes you'll see people say that code switching is just generally register switching, where you move between contexts and you change the way that you speak. You usually see code switching referred to during a, quote, single speech event where one might be talking and then someone else enters the room or the context, which then changes the way that the speaker is speaking oh, or something about the context changes. And so within a conversation, All right? So in a, in a classroom, for example, you might have people in the classroom before the teacher has arrived and they are speaking with each other as equals and probably in more socially equal, less rigidly defined ways. But when the teacher enters oh. the room, there is now this element of role disparity that has been introduced as well as power disparity that is introduced with the teacher entering the room that then because of this stratification and because of expected behavior within the classroom context yeah might shift the way that students are talking to each other or if the teacher winds up embroiled in those conversations right the way that people are then addressing the teacher but something that i think is more like what people think about when they hear code switching is when people speak two languages okay fluently okay you will find that there are times and there are very specific situations in which people will in the course of a single speech event switch between languages Okay. Even over the course of a single sentence. Sure. I have multilingual friends of mine who will have conversations with their family members where this friend of mine would switch between English and Greek because in the same sentence because yes. some certain words reflect a concept or idea better than it does in the whatever language that they're speaking. And since they both speak both languages. Yes. And so that is something that has a lot to look at and a lot to unpack and it relates a lot to again relationships it mm -hmm. relates to indexicality which i'm going to break down in a second and yeah. then it also relies very very heavily on a strong mastery of both languages right, you will yeah. sometimes see people who are learning a language and they don't know a word right. and the difference that you'll see is they'll insert a word from a language that they do know but it'll usually be incredibly hedged it'll be uh um it's like your head <laughs> and then they switch back into the language that they are learning trying to complete that thought in that language right right whereas with code switching it requires linguistic mastery yeah yeah because you aren't interrupting the stream of language in that way you are not right. marking it right. as an error yeah it is speech that you are using as a tool a, a, exactly. as a fine tool really Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you have, do, can you think of examples in the show for things like this? Is code switching and register switching that, that you can relate to? Yes. I was actually digging through some stuff last night. And when I thought about code switching, Jaime is a really, really strong example of uses of code switching, both successful and not as successful, in my opinion, right. over the course of the show. Right. So thinking about Jaime and thinking about the way that he linguistically sort of navigates his reality, right. particularly his relationship with Ty stood out as something that was interesting to me. Right. For those of you who for some reason may or may not know, so we're talking about Jaime Reyes, who is the Blue Beetle in season two, and Ty Longshadow, who is his best friend, who um, becomes later on Longshadow, I think they refer to him as, mm -hmm. in season two as well. Yeah. So I was looking for an episode that really encapsulated a lot of places where I might be able to look at that linguistically. So I watched the season two episode Runaways. Yeah. Which actually had a lot more code switching in it than I anticipated. Oh, yeah. But some of it was 
to different effect. Some of it was, it seemed, trying to convey instances where a character wasn't as competent in in language. That's interesting. Eduardo's father, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, at one point, he is looking at Asami, I think, and says, Mi mijo, my, my son. And he's doing that because the urgency of the situation, I guess, is supposed to leave you with this, this idea that he's slipped into Spanish as opposed to English when he's trying to convey this urgent message. Right. But you also see some interesting use of code switching in other senses where you see actually Jaime and Ed like dealing with each other. And I think that Jaime calls everyone collectively essay and then very, very pointedly and as a way to specifically, I think, index common linguistic heritage, but also to essentially develop distance between them. Hmm. Ed very, very pointedly uses and calls Jaime hermano, which is brother, but he's rustling against him. Oh, so like almost like sarcastically using yes, it? Yes, oh, exactly. Oh, interesting. And so doing that establishes that they have this common linguistic repertoire. And right. so in one sense, he's pulling him in. And at the same time, he is pushing, pushing him, him out. Away. Oh, that's so interesting. Well, we kind of touched on a couple of things too. You started to use indexicality a little bit yes. here in that description. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah. Do you have any examples that might parallel that? And then we can dive into some other things with the characters? Absolutely. So indexicality is the idea that when you say something, even single words, but phrases, expressions, whole sentences, they don't exist in a vacuum. When people explain indexicality, they often use smoke and fire, where smoke indexes the idea that there is a fire. When you see smoke, you probably don't just think, oh, there's smoke. It makes you understand, oh, that means there's got to be fire nearby. Right. Right. And so people will say things that then... Like imply something else or plug into some other concept or idea, you mean? Right. Essentially, they have associative value. Right, right, right. That is marked in the language that gets used. And you see this in all sorts of ways. If you look at Aqualad's speech, he very, very rarely uses contractions. He right. tends to have a very formal yeah. speech, which, as far as I can tell, is designed to index both his background as someone who is intelligent and from something of an academic background as right. well as someone who has spent time in service of a king but i also think in part it is serving to index his to, it's used to index the fact that he's foreign mm -hmm. so he doesn't speak accented english like you might expect someone with a background in atlantean right to speak but he does speak in a different way that sometimes seems almost register inappropriate, right. where he's speaking with very, very close friends, but is still not necessarily using contractions, which right. then indicates that he has a different background that he's pulling on when he's interacting with people. Yeah, when I think of, it's hard for me not to think of a character, when we're talking about a character who doesn't use contractions, it's hard for me not to think of data from star trek the next yes. generation but it's so interesting to me when you mentioned that actually i hadn't thought about it but he doesn't use contractions we're talking about calder but he somehow still manages this warmth and charisma and connection with with his friends where you think yes. not using contractions would, would make him feel like he's more standoffish or or um, not relaxed i guess is the word i'm thinking of Right. And they actually, I would say, managed to do that very, very masterfully because he maintains a resistance to contraction that isn't necessarily universal, that mm -hmm. propels itself through his relationships. But I do believe that there are cases in which he does use them. And it's almost always when he's dealing with people with whom he wants to establish intimacy. So he's trying to draw people close together sometimes when he drops them, but you don't necessarily consciously notice he just said we're not we are yeah unless you're being very very observant about it but i haven't he's... noticed that is like he's using it with tula or garth or like that um, kind of thing um I th i'm gonna have to go watch downtime again yeah i need to go and watch some more episodes because i wasn't able to dive in as deeply to calder as i maybe wanted to mm -hmm. but a lot of the time it's when he's talking to the team okay and specifically when he's talking to the team outside of having a sort of superior present. Oh, interesting. Okay. So not like when he's either team leader, 
versus him relaxing in the cave with the team, you're talking about like whether like Red Tornado or Batman or Canary are present. Right. Oh, and interesting. it can also reflect his status as leader because essentially choosing not to use contractions is actively, if not consciously, closing the power distance between him and the person whom he is speaking to. How, whoa. Uh, okay. Unpack so, that a little bit. <laughs> That's essentially if he uses more rigid formalized language right that is a way in which someone is kept at a sort of distance because there is uh. indexical value that indicates either intimacy or a casual environment that is associated with using i'll instead of i will and so huh. using i will indicates that there's an air of formality or rigidity within the situation that is being maintained linguistically right. through the employment of those words. Whereas when he chooses instead to drop those and use the contracted version of the words, whether right. or not it's an active recognition in the listener or the audience, it is signaling essentially that there is now less distance there. There's less rigidity Mm -hmm. The walls have kind of collapsed a little bit. And so he's closing that distance between himself and his comrades. It makes me wonder, uh, I want to talk to Carrie Payton about this now, who's the voice actor for Aqualad. I, I, I'm sure that they have incorporated this idea into writing his dialogue. But I imagine after a period of time, Carrie Payton got used to the character and kind of understood when to flip into and out of certain situations mentally as an actor will is want to do, right? right. And as an improvisational actor, like that you were nodding your head while I was saying. This. Yes. Yeah. So that's something that I think is really worth noting because there is a level to which we consciously understand our context and our situation. Right. And depending on that situation, we will sort of switch the way that we speak. But at the same time, we aren't necessarily aware of all of the ways in which we are changing our speech. We just have a sense for what is and is not appropriate. appropriate and for we can't the time, yeah. even always necessarily say why. Aside right. from like, that's just the way that you talk in this situation. Right. Yeah, you're blowing my mind a little bit. I love it. And to get into another interesting point about indexicality or example of indexicality within the show, I also watched last night the first episode of season two. Okay. And there's a moment where you see power distance closed repeatedly over the course of about two utterances. Oh, okay. Interesting. So after Tim Drake, Lagoon Boy... And Jaime right. have just rescued all of the people in the right. underground Zeta Beam chamber. Right. They come up and the Justice League arrives. Right. And Dick's there and he says, and, way to get your feet wet or something like that. Yes. And I think he says, dude, way to get your feet wet. Yes, he does. Right, right, right. So, but before that, Tim, I don't remember the specifics, but he used some sort of very, very informal speech. Okay. He might have even said like, uh, guys. Yeah. And then pointed upwards as the Justice League descended. So at that point, he was going from giving commands like, Lagoon Boy, you're on my six. Right. To, right. uh, guys, which indicated that his relative power over them had been collapsed and they were now essentially on the same level of the power dynamic. Interesting. And then Dick's arrival and using that language because he is of a higher status status than they are there's also relational navigation where right because they're adopted brothers there, there's and, multiple yeah, relationships right. they're teammates they're adopted brothers uh, right. one has superiority over the other so that's something that takes a lot of time to unpack but in that one sentence right dick actually closes the power gap between himself and tim drawing right. in a sense through their act of heroism tim and the entire gamma squad right closer to oh. dick in terms of power and by extension the justice league because he's using this highly informal language which causes yeah. that to collapse interesting because when you first said that i was thinking like oh so like tim collapsed his own leadership by changing you can see the way that his brain thought like okay mission's done justice league's arrived now as soon as i see people of authority that are not me on my first mission i can let go of this emergency need to be leader exactly and then but when dick comes down and says that i was thinking like oh well i guess dick is lowering himself to their level but you're saying it's the other way around he's actually saying basically welcome to the team almost like not like he wasn't yes. before but like in a different manner and he actually i think is simultaneously doing both because yeah. an ongoing thing from that episode was the idea that superboy mcgann and nightwing all explicitly chose not to join the league. Oh, right. Yeah, that's true. But Zatanna and Rocket had. Exactly. 
So they're maintaining their status as members of the team. And so though Dick is sort of pulling them up, he is simultaneously drawing them closer to the Justice League and pulling himself farther away from them huh. through expressing this affiliation with the team. Yeah. So by distancing himself from the higher tier of power and then closing the distance between the lower tier of power, he's actually kind of bringing the top and the bottom tier closer together. Right. Right. <laughs> That's so interesting. So let's get back to the team a little bit. I know you talked earlier about the difference between being multilingual versus studying linguistics. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a writer, I have an interest in language and how it affects thought and, of course, how we communicate and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I do want to pull in some of the ideas of the characters and their languages. According to Greg Weissman uh, in an Ask Greg thread from back in 2011... Uh, the linguistic skills, or the language skills, I guess I should say, of the team are basically as follows. Of course, they all speak English, but Aqualad not only speaks Atlantean, but he can also um, speak ancient and modern Greek, which uh, if you heard our episode with Neil um, Powell talking about the video game, he talks about how one of the scenes takes place in Greece, and that some of the research that Tula does in the video game has to do with the fact that she understands ancient and modern Greek, which is clearly a, apparently a precursor to Atlantean. Right. And which that's... is fascinating. Yeah, I think that a lot of that has to deal with the perceived indexical value of Greece as it relates to Atlantis as being sort of the culture which originated the idea of Atlantis as a cultural right. concept. Wasn't it Plato? I haven't actually looked up. Was yes, it I think it was Had Plato and the Republic discussed Atlantis. The idea of Atlantis existing? Yes. Yeah. And um, then... There's also like academic value where we imply or we associate ancient Greek with with in intellect, essentially. Right. Mathematics and other things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Miss Martian, of course, English and Martian. But we might touch on, hopefully, as well, the idea that she can telepathically translate languages, how that works and how that affects you. And is it concepts that are being translated? And what if there's no concept in another language? We'll, we'll dive into that a little yeah. bit. Kid, Kid Flash <laughs> has a little high school Latin. That's nice. Again, indexing. <laughs> uh yeah intellect and status absolutely and the kid flash in here as silly as he is he is also i mean hands down he's right up there with uh robin being technical and absolutely. they work together to macgyver through a lot of uh issues uh artemis of course speaks, speaks english um she also speaks vietnamese and french um because of her heritage as well yep that's super interesting um robin speaks english and can get by in french spanish italian german japanese mandarin chinese and his last statement was at least <laughs> so he has some passing familiarity with all of those languages at the minimum but here's the thing that, that that's a kicker for me and we talk about this in our drop zone episode which blew me away when i first saw it in drop zone there's a moment where superboy is overhearing bane speaking spanish to one of his minions and then has a little smile on his face and it's the moment you realize that Superboy not just speaks Spanish, but it was kind of a mind-blowing moment where you're like, oh my god, of course the genomes implanted possibly every known Earth language into his head via the Matrix, because if he has to take Superman's place, he's going to need to go all around the world to mm -hmm. do what they're doing. And it just blew my mind, because you have this character who's this brash, you know, teen angst, you know, focused character who suddenly has this whole new intellectual you know, view. Uh, according to Greg specifically, he says, speaks many, many languages, Superboy does, including, but not limited to, English, Spanish, French, Korean, Arabic, Russian, etc., he says. So we're going to get, we're going to dive a little deeper into those mm -hmm. things. But one of the things I want to talk about, I want to talk about Robin because I always want to talk about Robin, but not necessarily what Robin can speak, but the language and wordplay that, that Robin uses in the show seems very linguistically focused, like, and maybe touching on the idea of how language and its use like this can kind of inform different characters. Yeah. And I think that that's something that's really, really interesting. So there is personality and characterization that occurs through language because you essentially have two means by which to convey these things three things ostensibly in a visual medium right you have language you have action and then you have outward presentation over which a person has a degree of control but not as much control necessarily of what they say or what they do hmm. so looking at those three things in concert allows for one to develop sort of an idea of the type of person that they're dealing with. And because you have more control over what you say and what you do, 
that right. provides sort of a more granular look at characterization and something that's important to understand from the point of view of sociolinguistics is that identity if not personality because personality is sort of a psychology concept and is inherently assumed to be relatively not if not entirely stable but identity is something that is on some level external to a person it is socially and contextually situated okay wait wait yeah i'm gonna unpack <laughs> no, that no 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 no. i'm just like my, my brain's catching up personality versus identity yes i'm sorry that's fantastic okay yeah un unpack that I, I, yeah. I just needed to yeah go so personality <laughs> is sort of this idea in psychology of this stable of relatively stable traits that a person has over time you might see some change but people will tend across situations to tend towards certain preferences, certain emotional states, certain maybe even cognitive styles, what have you, even if at the state level, like moment to moment, there is difference there. But identity is the way that you are externally portraying yourself right. or the way that you are being externally received. Sorry, I'm gonna, I, I hate interrupting you, but I can't not think of McGann in this conversation. Yes. The idea of identity versus personality in this? Yes. Okay, let's, let's switch gears then from Robin over to McGann with this. Okay. Can you, is that okay? Can you dive into that? Yeah. Bit? So that's something that with McGann, she's got a lot of anxiety, especially going through the right. first season about her identity. Essentially, she is afforded a level of control over that third aspect, physical appearance. Oh, yeah, in yeah. a way that no one else really <laughs> <Right>. is. <laughs> you spend the entire first season, or most of the first season, I think, assuming that she's a green Martian. And then right. eventually you learn, in fact, she's a white Martian. Yeah. And so in part of her portraying herself and establishing this identity, she is actually using this third tool as a way in which to get people to understand certain things about her. Because she is taking the visual aesthetic of Megan. Right. And has incorporated that even into her green Martian form. Right. Which she is using right, to actively right, right. distance herself from her white Martian identity. Right. And then linguistically, she reinforces that through the use of what is essentially valley girl talk. Right. And you'll see her drop into more, I'm not going to say casual, but less archetypal or stereotypical interaction with people as she gets more comfortable with them right particularly in season two her language is totally different right um, and her appearance for that matter i mean she does yes. little things like she still has that that megan morse look but she has like the shorter hair and like there's little choices she makes yes and it's, it's much to me it's very interesting because uh, as opposed to you know a normal human she could cut her hair but from literally moment to moment she could choose to have long hair short hair spikes on her head it doesn't matter but yeah. she's choosing this particular look and it's and keeping it that way for a particular reason like she's owning part of that megan morris identity but she's making it her own somehow i think that that's definitely a part of it there's also the idea of visual continuity from a storytelling perspective right, exactly but then also i think as a character and in terms of navigating who she is in relationship to other people maintaining constancy mm -hmm. or the illusion of constancy mm -hmm. allows for changes that are made to have more relative impact right so you notice that she changed her hair but if she just suddenly looked like another green martian that would be a little bit more difficult for the viewer to easily grasp okay so this is who we're dealing with right as well as for the people that she's talking to or dealing with right that's true because in a way megan morse or the look that she has I mean, it's her secret identity when she turns Caucasian, mm -hmm. right? But it's what she looks like as a superhero. So if she's going to be maintain that personality and be a symbol, like mm -hmm. a lot of these heroes are, even though the team still isn't technically a public team, she still wants to maintain that relationship that she has with other people through both a language and uh, like all of these things all piled together. Exactly. And so I think Megan is interesting because it allows you an avenue by which to look at that as someone who has control over certain certain things that we don't all have control over yeah we can get haircuts we can buy different clothes right but she can change the color of her skin she can change how tall she is she like right. there's any sort of different things that she how many arms she has coming out of her head exactly <laughs> so she yeah. is actually able to use this repertoire to index various things about her identity because right. indexicality isn't necessarily entirely tied right. to 
linguistics, but it is tied into this kind of idea of symbolic capital okay. or symbolic value, where huh. we have associations between things and ideas and right. then other things and ideas. Right. And so maintaining this Megan Moore's general exterior allows for her to actually make more prominent the things about her which she is choosing now to highlight and the ways in which she is now choosing to interact with people mm -hmm. more salient yeah and something that i think is important to highlight there is that she's changing very little about herself externally her internal relationship to herself may have changed right but she is actually leaving most of the work for interpreting what that means to the people around her okay to Dead. interpret what it means she's cut her hair quote unquote cut yeah she's like quote unquote cut her hair <laughs> right. and she's quote unquote changed her style right and we have the ability to sort of understand because of the visual aesthetics what does that mean what does it mean now that she has taken this look and altered it right and i'm fascinated by this whole idea that is something that you essentially have to because again this is that idea that identity is a process it's something that's ongoing it's not stable right and it's socially constituted where it's not in a vacuum right exactly if she right. were just to change her look alone and never interacted with anybody you could never really understand necessarily or see the ways in which change had emerged right but because she does that it's actually leaving a lot of the work of interpretation of these changes to the people around her and that can mean different things to different people right right so you aren't going to have everyone always understand you or who you are in the same way and a lot of that can be contextually bound but you can very intimately know different people and they might see different aspects of you right. quote unquote yeah because the situation draws that out and so your identity is relatively fluid depending on the situation that you're in and who you're talking to right but the kind of through line of your personality of who you are at your core maintains relatively the same through your whole life where your self self identity and social identity might move around right morph. and that's one of those interesting things where i'm not sure if there's any psychological anthropology research that sort of unpacks that Mm -hmm. which I would be interested to see because personality psychology assumes that personality is a constant. Right. And then even social psychology and then anthropology, sociology, they all sort of assume that the self or identity is nested socially and cannot exist in a vacuum by its very nature. Interesting. If there's, you know, no one to hear the tree fall in the woods kind of a thing. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, well, let's let's dodge back over to Robin again while I process this whole thing with McGann. So Robin, of course, the most obvious thing about Robin, even from the very beginning is, you know, what the name of the show is based on mm -hmm. is, uh, and we dove into this in our conversation at the coffee shop, this, the, the idea of his breaking down of language and exploration of language and how that informs him as a character to us, how mm -hmm. he informs us about who he is as exactly. opposed to someone like Wally or Superboy or mm -hmm. Calder, right? Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah. So if you look at the way that Dick uses wordplay, it shows that he has this level of awareness of the way that language is constructed and language is navigated in the way that meaning he's actually acknowledging in interesting ways that the meaning of words is on some level arbitrary okay. because if there are these words like overwhelmed and underwhelmed but we don't have this idea of being whelmed at least in our common vernacular you have to understand that on some level the fact that we attach this over and under value to the idea of being whelmed is on some level arbitrary someone just said this is what this means right and everyone agreed to it right and so it shows on some level this tacit acknowledgement of that. Right. It's actually interesting looking at his linguistic repertoire of languages that he does speak because the fact that he plays with words like this actually on some level might be indexing the extent to which he has been trained in the use of other languages because oh, people right. who are bilingual do have sort of different relationships to language than people who aren't. And so it draws or might draw certain attention to the way that thoughts are conveyed, sentences are constructed, and words are used right. that could be theoretically impacted by the fact that he has all of these languages that he does know, or is at least passably fluent in 
Right. And beyond that, it continues to index the idea that he's had this training with Batman, and that training is about sort of lateral thinking. You yeah. solve the best cases, like all of the best detectives, including Batman, solve cases through essentially lateral thinking. It's thinking outside the box. It's knowing the rules so that you can break them and analyzing things. So it's indicating his training. It's indicating his intellect and curiosity. Yeah. And it's also indicating that he has this sort of almost like intuition that he relies on that pulls him to pick apart and then question other things like after he gets to a certain point. Right. And so all of his wordplay is in part to convey character and thought process. Yeah. But it's also to convey those important things to the people around him and to the viewer. Yeah. Where, sure, he's thinking these things, but why is he saying them? Right. It's interesting because in, I'm thinking of the scene in episode one where they figure out that these genomes are happening. I don't remember what floor. They were in like mm-hmm. halfway down or whatever. And they get into the elevator to theoretically leave to run away. Mm-hmm. And Robin has them going down. <laughs> right. And Kid Flash is all, dude, <laughs> out is up. And he's like, yeah. But Project KR and the answer to this mystery is down. And it was the idea that, yeah, there's no way he's not going to get all the data possible and follow the trail where it leads. I loved seeing that aspect of him and not being a jerk about it, just saying like, no, there's more here and we need to figure out what that is before we even know what's happening. We We need all the data. And... That's a kind of interesting because I think when combined with the wordplay that he does, it implies this thing about Dick where to him almost getting to the answer will allow for the backfill of some data where oh. jumping down and see what's going on there then allows for this kind of post facto or like after that you can fill in like the small stuff. Right. Connecting well, the dots. Exactly. Yeah. And he's very aware of the small stuff. Obviously that's part of what the wordplay indicates about his character. Right. But it also indicates that he'll jump to this sort of end point and then sort of play around with that from there and see how yeah. it might spiral backwards into what has happened or its implications beyond where it's at. So like you're saying, it's it's this lateral instead of like linear thinking process, right? You take what you're looking at and look at it from any direction and every direction and pick up pick it apart. So not just, okay, I need clue A that leads me to clue B that leads me to clue C and then I'll have the answer. It's like, not necessarily. Like I could get clue C and then clue D. It doesn't have to be in chronological order. It doesn't exactly. have to be in any order. He can take them and play with them like a Rubik's Cube until he gets to piecing hopefully the answer to the mystery up right and i think that that is interestingly contrasted with wally who i think is something more of a (laughs) mechanistic thinker (laughs) mechanistic linear mechanistic yeah exactly uh he's got an inventory background in certain ways where he recreated the experiment that caused barry (laughs) excellent point right and that's in this canon how the kid flash like became kid flash and that's fascinating right so you're able to contrast that. I actually, unfortunately, didn't get to watch that much with Wally in it uh-huh. as I was going through and reviewing for this, but he does use a lot more. He uses differently casual language. He uses what I feel like people attribute slang value to. He says dude. Yeah. And I could talk a long time about dude, but there's plenty of papers that analyze the sociolinguistic value of dude, and I say that they are very, very worthwhile reads. <laughs> Interesting. I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but fascinated by that whole uh. idea. Yeah, a lot of it has to deal with what it does and doesn't index, but Wally is simultaneously casual and mechanistic, and Dick creates distance between those around him, especially early on, yeah. where he has been so hard-coded by Batman to always protect your secret identity. Yep. You never leave home without your utility belt. <laughs> you always wear your sunglasses in the cave. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so he is visually creating distance right. in his portrayal of his identity. And then he is linguistically doing that by what he chooses to say and what he chooses not to say. For example, what he's planning to do. Right, exactly. Yeah. You guys weren't right behind me? Right. (laughs) That's awesome. And so, yeah, he's constructing and navigating his identity with all of these different people through the way that he is choosing to use or not use language. Right. I, I just, I'm sorry, like my brain is processing all of the things that we're diving into. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if, listeners, this is very, very <laughs> dense. <laughs> Feel free to pause and come back, because yes. that's what I'm doing, and we're just going to cut my pauses out <laughs> <laughs> while I try to understand yeah. all this 
amazing new info. So let's let's switch over to Superboy a little bit and yes. his downloaded languages. There's two things about Superboy when we were talking we discussed. One was the fact that he just has I mean, we don't know how many. So theoretically, every known world language mm-hmm. could be downloaded into his head. And if that's the case, like the fact that he knows them is one thing, but the fact that he didn't learn them through an educational process, like, is there a difference between like, okay, I have worked four years to learn all of the intricacies and the trials and errors of learning Latin versus, okay, yeah, I can technically speak Latin. Is that like, is it the same as me using a translator on my phone to talk to somebody? And then second of all, I wanted to talk about, I don't know if it, I don't know if you call it a code switching, but mm-hmm. in the episode with North and South Relasia having their conflict where he and McGann are in school while Calder and Roy are dealing with Lex, the teacher, Snapper Carr, asks about it and Superboy rattles off this data, and he, but he mm-hmm. gets a very robotic voice that we don't really hear from him in, in most of the rest of the series. I don't think it happens again, if I remember correctly. Right. Doesn't. So, but it tells us that he has a lot of data in his head that he can Mm -hmm. access, but is he constantly accessing it? Right. Does that all make sense? Yes. So I'll speak to that part first, actually. And I'll say that I think maybe that there was a degree of changing register that you see happening there. Right. And there's also this idea in sociolinguistics of what is called marked speech. Okay. And what they were doing is by having him change his tone and speak in this very sort of rigid, formal, academic register, is they were marking his speech. They were making it seem abnormal to draw attention to it. Right. And in doing that, I actually think that you get some characterization here for Superboy, but they're actually also simultaneously characterizing and world building around Project Cadmus and Project KR and all of the cloning. They're using him to convey information and sort of associative detail about what they're doing yeah through that yeah so i talked a few times about our my what i call my holy trilogy the idea that when you have a scene the scene should do more than one thing Mm -hmm. you should move the plot forward give information develop character if you can do two or hopefully three all three of those things Mm -hmm. in one scene this scene gives develops character and talks about him but it literally gives information about the world at the same time it's happening yes and in a way moves the what you're saying is you've just plugged in the fact that it is a third thing which is moves the plot forward because it isn't until the end of that episode where we realize that lex and Raish have been working together Mm -hmm. to make this happen in the first place so actually i thought that scene did two things but i was wrong it does all three of the things that it needs to do and i didn't even know it yep super super interesting i love it Wow. And (laughs) speaking to Superboy's, his mastery of multiple languages, it's interesting because I think at the same time, it's doing that sort of world building about and conveying information about Cadmus. And you have to sort of break apart the difference between language acquisition versus language learning. Yeah. And right. Exactly. He has acquired several languages, which language acquisition is a lot easier and a lot more authentic than language learning is because you reach something of like a critical period, I guess, in language acquisition around the time you hit puberty, like 12, 13, where suddenly you can't sort of passively absorb languages and it becomes this sort of effortful process by which you have to learn the languages. Right. And even when you're like really, really young, you start learning to distinguish and discriminate different sounds and then you don't learn to distinguish and discriminate other sounds on the basis of what you hear in language around you. Interesting. There's like LR fusion that you sometimes see people talk about in certain a- Asian languages right. where there's not the discrimination between the la and the ra sound. Right. And there's a distinct phoneme that those languages use that actually exists kind of somewhere between the two. Right. But it's not because they have a concept of L and R and they are choosing to meet them in the middle. It's completely discrete and orthogonal. Right. And so chances are Superboy has this more sort of innate, nuanced understanding of the languages. But it also seems like, because it's hard to really understand the full implications of what being able to think and switch between that means, like on a practical level, they're all functionally treated, I think, and this isn't necessarily a super great thing, but they're all on some level kind of treated as English wearing a different skin. Like right, yeah. his underlying thought processes and the way that he plays with language doesn't seem to be that much changed. 
right. by the fact that he knows all these languages where you're able to pull out all of these really weird, interesting implications about Dick's thought process that could theoretically be nested in the language learning that he's done. Right, right. I just remembered in the comics as well to make another reference that Greg didn't happen to mention at the time. Maybe the comic hadn't come out, but there was a, one of the comics where Calder brings McGann and Connor to Atlantis. And of course, McGann is telepathically translating the language, mm -hmm. her language for herself and for the Atlanteans around her. But Connor just blatantly says, oh no, I can speak Atlantean. Mm -hmm. I, genomes programmed it into me. I right. Know it. Or like, I love the, I, I, sorry, just a bit of an aside. I love the idea that in this DC universe, you could literally just take high school Atlantean. Right. Right. Like, yeah. Theoretically, one of the largest countries on the planet. <laughs> like you could mm -hmm. just take high school Atlantean and that's a language and that's right. a thing. And they've taken time to make it a thing. But stepping back to what you were talking about, mm -hmm. that's where I was trying to figure out, like, it seems like that moment where he pulls out this North and South Relasia data it's as if he's accessing a file mm -hmm. that he may or may not necessarily register or understand on a daily basis. Like yes. yesterday, he probably didn't consciously understand North and South Relasia, mm -hmm. but if somebody asked him, he could access it. And I feel like yes. maybe his languages are the same and that they're not affecting his personality. He just can use them as like a translator, I'm like a Google thing on my phone that I use to talk to people. You know, like, right. I don't know how to say this in Spanish, so I'm going to do this and have the computer tell me. Right, and it's hard to tell because we don't actually get a chance to see Superboy in a whole bunch of sort of multilingual situations where right. we don't get as much of an opportunity to maybe tease that apart. But I think that that could be sort of an implication where it's almost like uh, this might be a familiar phenomenon to listeners where sometimes you'll remember something and it's like, oh, yeah, I like I remember that happened. And then you think about it a little more. Yeah. And then it seems a little bit sort of like the floodgates open up. And then you remember a bunch of associated right. memories with right. that. And I think that the Relasia thing might kind of be like a super accelerated, punched up form of that. Right. Where he gets hit with it and then they mark it using his speech. Right. And so he has this awareness, but he doesn't necessarily have it in the same way. Yeah. That someone like Dick might have. Who's got this this body of knowledge. With Dick, you can see how like his knowledge of French might have informed his learning of Chinese in some mm -hmm. way or Japanese. How they re reflect it, he'd be like, oh, this is like or unlike the other language I spent a long time learning. Exactly. Where Superboy just has a file. Yes. And it's funny because this is kind of maybe sound like a strange analogy, but when uh, I first started dating my now wife, I had this bizarre terror of ice skating. So my wife took me to go teach mm -hmm. me how to ice skate properly. <laughs> and while I was ice skating, I was terrified of falling and it was affecting what I was doing. And, yeah. I, and I fell and it hurt. And I was like, man, I really wish I understood how to take a fall, which if you know me is an absolutely absurd thought process to have because I've spent off and on 20 years studying Aikido, which is a martial art entirely involving yeah. falling. <laughs> and so I'm like, uh... What? What? Like, I could hear the language in my own mind saying this thing to myself, and I was like, oh, why don't I just open that file? I was out of practice because I mm -hmm. hadn't trained in a while, but I was like, oh, wait, it really actually felt like I was opening a file and like, okay, now let's get that muscle memory back. Oh, suddenly I'm not scared anymore. Mm -hmm. Because part of that training is learning how to not be scared to take a fall. Right. It was, it was a completely absurd and ridiculous mental exercise that was happening with myself. And that's how I picture why Superboy may be less affected by this language that he knows knows even though he knows them all it's interesting but d does it affect him or not is so right. fascinating and the same parallel to mcgann's ability to translate mm -hmm. languages telepathically right do you draw a so, parallel there i actually think that it's interesting because i think that they're actually almost on opposite ends of the spectrum interesting so i will say that i do think part of why superboy is so hard to unpack is because it's really, really difficult for someone to understand maybe what it means to be able to speak every yeah. language that might even be on Earth or have historically been spoken on Earth that we have right. sufficient data on right. in any sort of way other than statistically or numerically. Right. Whereas when you're dealing with a small handful of languages, you might be able to see how see each how plays how off the exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like the quantity then gets in the way of understanding the implications right and then with mcgann and psychic translation it's almost like there's the implication there that you talked about like if there's like an idea that doesn't work in one language 
while she's doing this sort of psychic translation, it seems like intent, like communicative intent is what gets across. Right, like a concept, and then that concept gets automatically translated within the person's head to whatever the nearest concept is for their language. Exactly. Right, which I think is, for Earth languages, I feel is already intriguing, but then you end up taking them and putting them on RAN in season right. two. And you have an completely alien set of frames of reference. Like, mm -hmm. funny, we have another Star Trek The Next Generation reference, but, you know, the uh, at Tanagra phrasing when Captain Picard is, is trapped on a planet with an alien and the alien is technically speaking English or the translator's doing English, mm -hmm. but he's speaking in metaphors the whole time. Right. That only makes sense to his own culture. So mm -hmm. uh, it's all I can think of. And of course, as is from a storytelling standpoint, you need to be able to tell the story that you're telling. So where yes. do you take that artistic license? How far do you take this concept before? or the story you're trying to tell gets buried in verisimilitude instead of moving the plot right. forward. Right. And so in a lot of ways, McGann's telepathy and in general translation and then psychic links and communication it is sort of a convenience or a contrivance by which you're able to get people onto the same page right or you're able to essentially in a more covert way use walkie-talkies right and then there's certain other cases where you do see it used as this private sort of channel of communication yeah, when yeah. other people are present yeah which I, I think of the scene where zatanna first gets introduced and she's all are you guys having a psychic conversation right now like she's watching their body language and mm -hmm. you can see her looking around the room as the team is doing this thing that you as a watcher is now completely used to because you've seen them do it yeah. but then you realize like oh well yeah they're doing it while batman and red tornado are standing in the room but yeah whatever but then you forget that zatanna's standing right there right and then she piece again just a reflection of showing that she's also a shocking like really smart strong character like all of them mm -hmm. run at and she's like yeah i can't tell if that's super cool or really rude like right <laughs> which i imagine feeds into this idea you're talking about this power dynamic right so that's definitely a part of it where if you look at it for mcgann initially she's just like casually reaching out and doesn't realize that she is invading privacy right when she's doing this and doesn't understand sort of the implication that that has for people right in terms of crossing relational boundaries like i don't want you to know these things like get out right i get um, to choose what exactly right and over time she sort of acclimates to that but then as they're communicating psychically more and more people are also sort of acclimating to this process but it's all operating very much like people either like sending like sort of small text messages to each other or speaking on walkie talkies while other people are present yeah and so it's essentially a, a way for them sometimes in the way that you do see with multilingual code switching to uh, index yeah who is and is not essentially a member of the in-group yeah or it's an avenue by which they seek privacy so in realizing that this is going on zatanna is keyed into the fact that she is not on the same relational level right as the rest of them and that in some ways her asking that is making an acknowledgement of it and then sort of asking to be informed on a more explicit basis yeah how where she does stand in the power dynamic yeah exactly that's really interesting because the, again speaking of the linguistics like re relational linguistic when they're uh on the bio ship and robin says you know i'm trying to be nonchalant about this and she mm -hmm. says mm -hmm. be as chalant as you want that just one scene between the two of them has so much information in it about who the personalities are again how her brain works which is similar in a way to his even though yes. his is more grounded in reality or grounded in in technical normal physics and hers is grounded in different level of imaginative play and and also yes. man of course i don't know how we can possibly have a conversation about language without talking about zatanna and her magic being words spoken backwards yes. and i was going to say <laughs> that i actually i don't know how many languages zatanna speaks but the fact that she gets to the chalant might actually be a way to yeah. index the way that she needs to be very very acutely aware of language and the way that it is structured so that she can flip it around and sort of on the fly right exactly. do spell casting backwards changes right. the way that she relates to words right. and their meanings I, I just realized that there are probably some some listeners out there who may or may not know this in netflix they kind of mess this up a little bit on the subtitles but if you're actually watching the subtitles on a lot of the episodes whoever's doing the subtitles understood that they are actually saying the sentences backwards so you will be able to 
see in the episode where the giant plants are attacking Zatana, or Zatara, I'm sorry, says something like fire consume this plant abomination or something. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the subtitles and you pause it, you will see that he's literally saying that sentence backwards. And in the comics, it was a way to show this kind of interesting tweak of like what's happening. And then once you kind of figured that out, it was this fun little cryptic thing as a kid to read him backwards and figure out exactly what he was asking to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, in some episodes, whoever did the translations for the subtitles would say like speaks Latin or speaks yeah. foreign language. But in other episodes, they either had a copy of the script or they knew what was happening. Also, just a quick nod to the freaking actors <laughs> yeah, who managed to like make something that sounded fantastic out of those mangled backwards English words. Yep. You know, it, I looking at him, it's like, hmm, how many takes would that take me? I know, exactly, right? And oh my God, the guy who does, I, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but the guy that does... Um, Zatara and of course Zatanna's uh, voice actress uh, freaking phenomenal it's amazing. really really amazing. good yeah there's a couple more things I want to hit before we before we bow out one of them you had mentioned um, code switching with Jaime and the relationship with Ty earlier I just want to see if there was anything else that you wanted to kind of um, speak to about that and then yeah I, you covered it pretty good earlier but I want to make sure we cover that because I think it's pretty interesting because of the diversity of language and culture and characters and even sexes and social yeah. stru structures in season two so I wasn't able to get as much into the dyad of Jaime and Ty as maybe I wanted to in the runaways episode because they are functioning as a group for most of that episode there's right. another episode in season two where you sort of get a look into their home situations right that I couldn't remember off the top of my head, so I didn't watch it, but I think that that's interesting. Uh, sorry, I just realized there's a couple of more Star Trek The Next Generation, or Star Trek in general mm -hmm. connections, because Robert Beltran actually does the voice of Ty's mom's boyfriend. He's the guy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, on top of that, of course, we have Marina Sirtis playing, you know, um, Queen Bee and some other characters as mm -hmm. well. I just, just a random thought process yeah. as I was replaying that episode in my head while you were talking. Mm -hmm. So Ty's, Ty's language and... Right, and so Jaime, like I said, I feel like in some cases they did manage to get this sort of, he sometimes uses it affiliatively with people, the code switching. Oftentimes with that sort of code switching, you're seeing it with two people who are equally fluent in both of the languages so that you are able to sort of conveniently midstream pick ideas that more adequately convey or index your intention, but he does that sometimes in order to close or create distance with people where with the runaways sometimes he's actively using it seemed to me whether or not this was intentional what i picked up from it was he was sometimes using his spanish like switching code switching mid-sentence english to spanish he's actually indexing a mutual sense of minority amongst all of the people okay where in using essentially the repertoire of things that spanish indexes he is creating a broader sense of community between himself and the other people with whom he's communicating yeah and sort of pulling them in so like we're all in this together we're all sort of on the run we're all so he's creating this sort of mutual broader minority identity that is then being indexed by his use of spanish right and i was actually interested in specifically looking at that episode where you get that deeper look at their home lives yeah. to see ways in which maybe that is or is not accurately the case. Interesting. And then sometimes, unfortunately, it does seem like they took a, a sentence and then just swapped in a couple Spanish words where it's hard to see what the communicative intent was. Right. Aside from communicating that maybe to the viewer, Jaime speaks Spanish. Right. I just realized this, though, that there's a period of time. I would like to correlate this, or if you go back and rewatch it again, let me know. There's a time, of course, where Green Beetle accesses Blue Beetle to theoretically free him, but mm -hmm. instead reactivates that beetle and, and mm -hmm. puts it under, puts it back on mode, right? After that, there's several episodes before you realize that Jaime is not able to control his own actions and that he's he's literally being puppeted by the Reach. And I'm wondering if some of those language slip-ups or weirdly placed things might be in a space or episodes in which Jaime is not actually in control of what he's saying. I don't know if that's the um, case, but I'm cu I'd be curious to go back and maybe. see. Maybe. I noticed some of it in episode one. Oh, pretty early on? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Interesting, because that would have been an interesting idea or, or right. nod or, or question for the watcher if you caught and, it, that something's right. weird and linguistically. Some of it, I think, in the first episode is them trying to just easily communicate and establish character. Right. 
where mm-hmm. Tim gives orders and then Jaime responds by code switching and then Lagoon Boy explains by essentially doing the same thing and using Atlantean Atlantean slang. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Interesting. So I think there's about uh, maybe one or two more things we've gone on for in a long time. We this have. has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, one comment I just wanted to make, I don't think we need to dive into too much, but if, if you're from a writing standpoint, mm-hmm. the idea that language when you're writing dialogue for characters, when, I'm, when I've been in writing classes or talk to people or you know teaching writing classes as well, the idea that how to do dialogue is confusing to people and that their characters sometimes, they're, they have to constantly add character tags to their dialogue mm-hmm. because they're finding that people don't understand who's ta- speaking at a moment mm-hmm. or another moment. Right. So the idea that a language for a character should be personalized and independent. Now in an animated series, you have some advantages because you've got a different sounding character, you have a different visual for yeah. the character as well so you know who's speaking but you know that if you took all of that away and put it in a not just a comic but if you put it in a novel you could have a full conversation between wally and dick and calder and connor and mcgann and artemis and you would know for the most part exactly who was saying what even though they're all speaking technically the same language yes exactly and I don't know if you want to dive into that a little bit, but it's an idea, it's a concept that blew my mind when I was learning about yeah. dialogue that, oh, you need to understand your character from the inside enough to not just throw in some language, just throw in some a unique catchphrase so people mm-hmm. know what's going on. Right. That gets annoying. But there is a different way that somebody speaks that informs who they are as a character so you can read that on the page. Yeah, and I think that that's actually something that I think that from a writing perspective, you have to look at this combination of, at least I do now, where you're looking at sort of what is the character's background because their background, their history informs their context and language and the what it is conveying is sort of contextually nested. So you look at the way that that plays into the context that a character's in, the way that it looks at and it reflects or is... Either the context that they have changes their interpretations of events or the present events change their interpretations of their context. Right. And that is going to change the ways in which people then choose to speak. And a lot of it's not super conscious. Like people just tend to speak. Speaking seems almost natural. You aren't being effortful when you do most of your speech acts. Right, right. But at the same time, being aware that there is a context to which this is bound allows for you to understand that context also reaches backwards in time. Your experiences are a part of the context that you might drag with you from situation to situation. And memory is malleable. Exactly. Yeah. And so I can't speak to it on a super, super deep level or get into it maybe as much as I would like to but i think that if you want distinct character voices understanding their background and context allows for you to carry that forward through different situations where there may be navigating different power dynamics where you will sometimes see people change the way they speak to people who are in higher stations than them but they're still being very very nonchalant or disrespectful or lax But you do see changes in the way that language is used because it's still needing to convey information and sometimes the respect is nested in there while simultaneously indicating a lack of respect or the difficulty of transitioning from being in many, many very rigid formal situations and then acclimating to how one speaks in less formal situations. So know your character and know your situations. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that really, really strong, differentiated character voices will emerge from there. Absolutely. And I I love this constant kind of bringing back to the relative power dynamic of the room that the character is standing in also kind of changes how I look at characters when I'm writing them as well. It's so interesting to me. Oh, yeah. Status is a huge part of good dialogue and good back and forth and good dynamic but we don't necessarily always recognize the way that it really really is encoded in our speech absolutely that's amazing so just to wrap up here is there anything else that you wanted to touch on or to to add to the conversation this very amazing sorry (laughs) i've lost all good words as my brain processes conversation i mean gosh i wish that i remembered the name of the article but 
if you really want to understand some interesting things about language and the way that sometimes we take things for granted, like slang, I could talk a lot about slang. There are some really, really good academic papers that have been written about the use of dude. If I can remember those, I will get them to <laughs> no, you. Please do. Uh, go ahead and send us. This episode will air a little ways out from mm-hmm. when we're recording it. So find those links. We will yep. put the links in the show notes and we'll put the links on the website as well. Awesome. First of all, I just want to say thanks. <laughs> thanks for joining us, spending some time with us in the cave, Quinn. Oh, yeah. Thank you for letting me <laughs> ramble for an hour and a half a into whole, the ears of your listeners about whole... things that I'm sure they were very interested in. <laughs> Yeah. Here. Oh, I I don't know. I was from many different perspectives. So where can people find you on Earth Prime if they want to pick your brain more? Oh, absolutely. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and my primary Twitter account is at monkeypiequinn. That is M-O-N-K-I-P-I-Q-U-I-N-N. Speaking of wordplay. And you can also find me on another Twitter account I have for my actual play podcast, which is called Swallows of the South, and our Twitter handle is at Swallows of South. Sometimes you might have the unfortunate circumstance of trying to communicate at me with at one of those accounts, and then I will respond to you using another account because... <laughs> I have no idea what that's like No with two accounts. <laughs> um, and you can also find me and my show at SwallowsOfTheSouth.com. I play around with a lot of cultural and linguistic stuff. Yes. in the course of the show because it's a framework that I kind of carry with me everywhere I go. Yes. But if you want to get into a conversation with me, Twitter is the place to do it. Absolutely. Thanks everyone for sharing time with us as well. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashing the mode, and on our website, www.crashingthemode.com. I encourage everyone to check out Swallows of the South. I randomly started with episode nine, and I remember having to pull the car over and sit in front of somebody whose house who probably thought I was a crazy person uh, because I could not focus on what I was doing because I was so emotionally taken away by what was going on in that in that episode. That is, um, thank you. That's a very, very high form of compliment. <laughs> that was a, you know the episode I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, there's like in media res, a uh, uh, thing for me to walk into, but I immediately went back and listened to the three or four episodes right before that to find out what the context was of this crazy thing that was happening. It was fantastic. And you can hear uh, Quinn's uh, amazing voice acting talents as well, which is pretty impressive. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also link over to Whelm, the Young Justice Files on iTunes, or your podcaster of choice and leave us a five-star rating. Ratings help us stay trot and, of course, help others to find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S., because we have to look a little harder to find those. Also, don't forget to hashtag keep binging YJ on Netflix, or if you don't have access to Netflix, you can pick up the show on DVD or on digital through digital venues to support the show. You can also check out the associated comics at your friendly local comic shop or on Comixology, and share Young Justice with a friend. And with that, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our computer is voiced by Madison Ray. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.